Hello. Welcome. I hope everyone can hear me. My mic is not muted. That is good. Welcome. I see we got some people in chat. Wicked Blue Ninja. Hey. Kinslayer. Chad B. Hey, man. Uh, good to have you here. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah. I hope everyone is having a good Christmas Eve. Got FTS Sec, J Beers, F Mikai, F Mikias, Mikias. Nice to see everybody. Okay, let's uh, fire up Stream Raiders. Okay, nice. Uh, Ranjit, uh, I don't know if that, Ranjit 08 Eater. I hope Ranjit is just good. Uh, Shikata, Berry Dwina, Merry Post Tibbs Eve, I know. So, if you're not following me on Twitter, which by the way, you should, I think I've got a. There we go. Um, one of my, one of my friends messaged me. And was like, do you know today is Tibbs Eve? It was yesterday. Um, with with two Bs, but close. Close enough. So I am I am declaring the twenty third of December. Um, my own my own little holiday. There we go. So that was fun. Uh, what are we doing today? We are doing what we generally do every Friday, which is Advent of Cyber 3. Uh, let me switch to my live screen. I'm just going to turn the music down slightly more so I can pay attention. There we go. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, I... Ein... K12? Or Ein KL2? Question is why is chat talking first than you talking UDP is slow? Yeah. I, I try and keep up. Uh Forza, greetings Siberius and chat. Hope you have a lovely day in Christmas. I am, thank you. Uh Idea No Sec. Really enjoy watching the streams, thank you. And Killer2224, welcome back. Yes, time for explanations. Um so we have been doing this for the past, I think, three weeks now maybe four um every friday we go through the last seven days of advent of cyber so i have been depriving myself of doing it every day so we can do it live on the stream and for some reason my attack box is not loading there we go okay so let's go on day 18 playing with containers okay Let's just read through quickly. Um, all right, so you need to start your attack to run commands using the Docker container tool. Okay, so we were playing with Docker, um, I think last week on um, on some of the hack the box stuff. I think, uh, but let's do it on the attack bot. Okay, so we need to boot up a terminal. So Docker is this really cool way of running the the kind of like VMs. They're not really, um, but you can run. You can like create entire operating systems with uh, Docker, and so you can run like Ubuntu um, in a Docker container, which is really nice. Um, but you can also just have a Docker container for a single like app, really. Uh, so it's really nice. Um, very confusing. I don't do much with Docker other than set up the occasional um, Docker container for stuff. But uh, yeah, let's see um, if we do Docker images. It's going to show us all the different images that Docker has. So it's got uh, Scyphe, it's got Rust Scan. It's got Empire and it's got Cyberchef, and I believe this is the 
the owner, the like the username um, of the person who created it. So yeah, we've got this. All right, Docker's containers are stored in repositories, which are a reference to file mappings the Docker daemon knows how to reach, which include the container.tar files. Each image in a repository will include an image tag, and images can be referenced using either their tag or image ID. All right. So what's the tag then? Hang on. Why can't there we go? That's a bit better. Okay, so the repository ID is this, and the tag is that, uh, and the image ID. So I think they actually mean they can be referenced using their repository name. Because I don't think you can just reference it by, because that's latest twice. Um, I know you can do something like you can you can use the tag as after a colon to specify which uh, version, I think. Oh, okay, so yeah, all right. I should have probably read down. So you do when you're using the tag, you do need to specify the actual repository name, or you could just uh, use the image ID. Alrighty. Um, trace the Grinch Enterprise's attack infrastructure back to the likely Elastic Container Registry that is publicly accessible. There's a link. Let's open that. Thank you, Kevin, for the follow. Uh, you can retrieve the potential Grinch, Enterpri Grinch Enterprises image by running the following command on your attack box. Okay, so we need to use the clipboard to paste that. Um, okay, so it's downloading this. You can run the container and interact with it by running the following command. Docker run. Let me just actually see what the I and T um, stands for. Because that might be educational. Interactive. I is interactive. Okay, so it keeps uh, standard input open even if it's not attached. Uh, so I guess it's not going to just background it. And the T allocates a sudo tty. Okay, that's nice. All right, so basically when we run this command, it's going to run this Docker, uh, run this Docker um, image in a new container. And it's going to give us effectively command line access to it, I, I would imagine. So let's copy this. Run Barrow, thank you for the follow. There we go. Yes, yeah, so we have a we have a prompt down here, uh, which opens a shell. So technically, yeah, we're we're not on the attack box right now. We are inside the Docker container on the attack box. Uh, so we're doing ls dash. Okay, so it is a sudo tty, so I can't do up uh, dash la. All right. Shows there are no regular files or subdirectories, um, but yeah, there are the standard bash logout bash rc and profile. A good place to check next is environment variables. In Linux and especially for containers, environment variables may be used to store secrets. Uh, we try print env, print environment. Okay, there we go. We have an API key. That's useful. Bonus challenge, a container image is comprised of a number of layers, perhaps there's sensitive information in the underlying container layer, layer that Grinch Enterprises didn't clean up as part of their build process. One key reason uh, that developers and hackers might package their application in a container is that a container allows a developer to freeze an application and its dependencies into an image as part of the build process. Okay, container image is built from a source called known as a Docker file. Um, Okay, I guess we'll we'll do this. Can we do we do this? No, we don't do this in the container, do we? Um, 
No. I wonder if there's any questions on this. I probably should scroll down. Okay, there's a lot of stuff. Um... Okay, all right, we'll go through it. It doesn't look like the API key is actually needed to complete this, um, but I will. We'll say we'll make a copy of it anyway. Uh, there we go. All right, so now I think I can just exit. All right, we're gonna make a directory called AOC. And then we're going to copy this command, docker save. So we're basically going to save this um, docker image into a tar file, I guess. All right. Um, as I've said before, I don't really use docker that often. So this is all pretty new to me. I definitely didn't know you could save um, Docker containers like this. Uh, Rumbara, I saw your video on AOC3. Thanks for that. Yeah, I had two videos, day seven and day 11. They were pretty fun. Uh, all about SQL. First one was no SQL injection. The second one was MS SQL um, doing command line uh, stuff. Um, I started doing the tasks every day. Now I knock out three to four days at a time. Yeah. Um, I figured I would make this a little uh, event every Friday. Just a guy, hello, welcome. Alright, it has saved. Um, once we save the image, we can further inspect the image by unpacking the compressed file. Okay. Uh, I could just type that actually. Dash XF AOC.tar. Okay. Um. All right, so they use verbose, so it listed them all. We don't need to do that. We can just do ls. All right, there we go. Um, these files represent the various container image layers with the exception of the manifest.json file. Manifest.json represents the manifest, obviously, of container image layers that compose the final container image we were just inside. Let's take a look at this image using a tool called jq. I love jq. Um, for those who don't know what JQ is, it's awesome. <laughs> um, it's effectively a, a neat little parser for JSON that also allows you to query. I think it's short for JSON query. Um, it doesn't actually say what it's short for. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty good. So you can actually do queries um, on the JSON input. All right, install JQ, we've done that. Uh, and then you can cat the manifest into JQ. So let's just cat manifest. So this is what's in the manifest file, this blob of text here, which is a JSON object. Technically it's a JSON array with a JSON object in it, I think. Uh, if you yeah pipe it through JQ, it just makes it nice and pretty. Um, but then you can do you can do fun stuff with JQ. I forget the syntax. Um, I think there's like if I do dots config. All right, I'm gonna have to look up the JQ syntax. Here we go. Um, basic filters. Yeah, the dot identify. All right, so I think if we, oops, we go back and do. Uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, maybe. Okay. Maybe it has to have proper quotes. I'm just right. I'm just messing around. I'm trying to get it to print out the config thing. I'm not entirely sure how I do that. I haven't used it in a while. All I know is you can maybe the array. I forgot the dot. I did. Yeah, that's not it either. Let's try the just the array, I guess. Uh, so for zero. Nope. I know you can run it directly on a file. Oops. Oh, did I not do a dot? I didn't do a dot. That's why. Why do I keep clicking them? All right, so I think if we do a dot, right, there we go. Okay, so now we can do the first, this is this is subtly different. Um, if you scroll up here, you see how it's an array. And now we're at the first thing in the array. So now I think I can do dot config. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, JQ is incredibly powerful. The syntax is just awful, but um, it kind of makes sense. Dot refers to the entire object at least when you start with it like the root object which was in this case an array then we're selecting the zeroth element of the array or the first element technically um, which was this actual json object um, and then we were just saying okay extract the config property which is this which obviously just gives us this string um, if we had the if we wanted the repo tags um, so we could do repo tags. That's going to give us an array, and then you can also do uh, the first element of the array as well. All right. Okay. Let's. Uh, da, da, da. I got a slight itch in my ear. Hang on. There we go. Okay. This configuration file is used also used to in the root of the unpacked container image directory. It can be inspected. Okay, so let's. I don't know why they're using cats when you can just um, do that. Um, maybe because of that. Okay, that's probably why. That's probably why they use cat. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why that didn't work. Oh, because I didn't do. No. Interesting. All right, I'm not sure why cat works and it doesn't just take the file in. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, first section of the manifest configuration file. Let me move this so you can all see it. Works with the final image configuration as intended to run on the container host system, right? So it's giving the architecture as 64-bit no host name, the user's new user, sets and environment variables. There's the API key from earlier. Okay. Uh, all right, and if we scroll down, we get, we get the history. Okay, so each of these sections is describing a particular command run by the Docker daemon at the time that the image was built. If the empty layer true configuration is not listed as part of the section definition, then the container layer is retained in the overall container image. Okay, so we notice the container con the container containers a tool container contains I think uh, a tool called env console. Let me see where that is. It looks like they grabbed it from Git. Um, Viewing the GitHub repo, the about description states env console is a tool that allows a user to launch a sub process within, with environment variables using data from HashiCorp console and vault. Okay, note the source code was cloned into a root directory. Perhaps there is something sensitive related to env console 
the regular container user isn't intended to see. Okay. Um, we can mo more closely inspect the layers by switching to the subdirectories representing the layers in the unpacked Docker root. Okay, right. So if I do ls-l, so these are the layers, the different layers. Um, it's telling us we need to cd into the one starting with 4.4. Four. If I do an ls in here. Um, and we extract the layer.tar. All right, we have this. So I'm guessing we can just cat that. All right. What have we got in here then? Um, maybe this thing? Ah, token. Okay. See if we can find a token. Yeah, I found the token. All right. I think that answers a question, right? So we can copy this. All right. So that's interesting. I guess this is kind of more like a forensics thing, exploring Docker containers a little bit uh, in more detail. I didn't know that you could... Um, you, you could uh, see all these different layers, which is interesting. So, uh, what command will list Docker container images stored in your local container registry? I think it's Docker images. We ran that at the start. Which command will allow you to save a Docker image as a tar archive? There was a save, so it's just Docker save. Apologies, my phone is blowing up. All right, it's just fine. What is the name of the file, including the file extension for the configuration, repository tags, and layer hash values? Uh, Manifest.json, right? All right, cool. We're done. That was an interesting day. Definitely a different... The, the thing I like about Advent of Cyber is there's, there's so many different kind of um, challenges. You know, so we started off with a lot of web exploitation and then moved on to networking and... Now we're kind of in, um, well, the cloud area, I guess. But this was kind of like a, a little bit of forensics almost. All right, we're now moving on to blue teaming. Oh, goodness. All right, this is, this is going to be bad. Let's start the machine. Um, McSkitty received reports of multiple phishing attempts from various elves. One of the elves shared the email that was sent to her along with the attachment. The email was forwarded as an .eml file along with the base64 encoder string in a text file. Okay. Okay, so this is all about fishing, I guess. Um... No, right, so this is just advice on how to detect phishing attacks. Uh, now you're going to dive in. Open the mail application. All right, so I guess we have to wait for this attack box to boot. Yeah, Rumboro, Um I know Trihack me are trying to get more blue team stuff. Um, so that's good. Oh, I didn't drag my captain onto the battlefield. Hang on. Let's do this. There we go. What's the command for Streamlabs? Um, I'm not sure if you... I think you can do battle. There you go.
Okay. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, open the mail application. Okay, there it is. So the email will open automatically for you. Inspect the file contents of the email to the email. Answer the questions below. All right, so can we just view message source? There we go. This is always the best way to view stuff. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so the attachment's going to be. There it is. Let's copy that. Uh, I guess we'll do, we'll do it back on the attack box, maybe. Uh, clear. Oh, that didn't work. Oh yeah, I need to... There we go. Okay, we're gonna echo that through base 64. And if I can spell correctly, oh dear, hang on. Base 64 dash D into attachment dot txt. Okay, now we can just open it in Vim. There we go. All right, so it's an email attachment, I guess. Oh, sorry, I know it's an email attachment. It's a it's a web page attachment. Uh, looks like. Um. Uh, you know the files are PDF. Oh, is this not the attachment? All oh, right, that was the email. Okay, so the email was sent as HTML. That makes way more sense. Um, where? I guess the attachment is. I'm trying to find the actual attachment on here. Right. So this is the this is the what we just base sixty four decoded. Can anyone see the attachment? It's in the directory. Mm -hmm. Oh, open Windows Explorer. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, was it a download? Email artifact. There it is. All right. All right, so yeah, we know it's a PDF. We, I mean, it says we know it's a PDF from the magic string, the magic header, right? But um, you can also tell because it's there. Literally, literally says it. Um, all right, I'm gonna go do this on the attack box. If it's not gonna completely kill me, okay, here we go. Um, all right, copy. Why did it skip up? Okay, go back to the attack box. Exit this. All right, so this, I'm going to move attachment to just email. Dixty. Uh, well, screw it. Let's just do the same thing. This is probably not the best way to do it. Base64 dash D. 
attachment .txt. Uh, and sorry, move attachment to attachment.pdf because it's a PDF. Uh, and then can we just open attachment? Does this thing have a PDF reader on it? Uh, maybe not, but Firefox usually can open PDFs. So let's check. XPDF. Um, I can try that. No, it's not installed. Um, I guess open the PDF with a payload in it. Well, yeah, it's on the attack box though. <laughs> uh, okay, let's actually answer the questions. Um, who is the email sent to? Answer is the email address. Well, duh. Um, okay, where are we? It was sent to... <laughs> Copy email address. That was a good... That was a good sound. I'm so glad I enabled that. <laughs> Alright, phishing emails use similar domains of their targets to increase the likelihood of the recipient will be tricked into interacting with the email. What does it say the email is from? Answer is the email address. No. S-H-I-T. Uh, submit. I don't want to set up a new account. Uh, oh, I, didn't, I guess I didn't copy the email address. Sometimes phishing emails have a different reply to addresses. This one does. Less sophisticated phishing emails will have typos. What is the misspelled word? Um, oh, I've just gone blind. All right, hang on. I'd like to inform you that your TBFC online banking has been temporarily limited because you haven't updated your password according to our new terms of use. You have to reset your password straight. There we go. Uh, straight. All right. The email contains a link that will redirect the recipient to a fraudulent website in an effort to collect credentials. What is the link to the credential harvesting website? Can we just right click? Yeah, we can. Copy link location. Uh, view the email source code. There is an unusual header. Do I still have the source code open? Yes. Uh, unusual email header. What is the header and its value? Okay. Um, Uh, this thing. X Grinch Fish. You received other reports of phishing attempts from other colleagues. Some of the other emails contain attachments. What is the name of the attachment? Okay, well, we can go back to this. We got it here, look. What flag is in the PDF file? Okay, so we don't need to actually open it, I guess. We can just... We can probably just grep. Um, oops, not LSD. That's a completely different thing. Uh, I'll just search for try hack me in the attachment.pdf. And if I do dash A, it should do binary files. No. Strings. Oh, because I didn't. Hang on then. I guess I didn't do that properly. Hang on. Let's let's copy this all again. Copy. Put it into the paste buffer. Switch back to the attack box. Um, 
I know. I mean, I guess we could just really do. I mean, no, screw it. Let's echo it again. Base sixty four dash D into um, attach dot PDF. All right, now we can grep. I'm just going to do dash A. Try hack me into attach dot PDF. Okay, it's not there. Um, head attached to PDF. Why is that not? Stop! Stop spamming! Just open the PDF. I'm trying to do it this way. I thought this was supposed to be the attachment. Am I copying the wrong thing? That's the same thing. Maybe they have different clipboard. I think that's what they have. Hang on. Um, I think I had I had different clipboards. Yeah, that's that's what that's what it is. All right. So, like, I guess the the clipboard isn't universal. Right, head attach. That's way better. All right, now we can grep. Jeez. Uh, okay, grep dash a try hack me in attach.pdf. No. Strings. Maybe it's not a try hack me thing. So it. If it's not in the text, it is possibly just in the actual PDF itself. So do we just open the PDF now? Maybe. Um, so yeah, let's just open the PDF, even though we probably shouldn't open the PDF. Uh, where's the open? Open file. Yeah, that was it. So we actually did have to, so whoever did that fail, <laughs> we actually did have to open the PDF. All right. Yeah, we don't, we don't just immediately open the PDF. We, we see if we can at least grep first. And it also, let me show you guys that grep-a, if you go to the man page of grep, Uh, process a binary file as if it were text because if you tend to grab a binary file it's not going to actually process it properly um, okay uh, we need to close that and start this machine all right, more blue teaming. What's the worst that could happen? McPayroll is processing the bonuses for all the hardworking elves. One of the elves has sent McPayroll a file they're claiming contains their updated payment information. The only problem is that she doesn't recognize the elf. Could this be a sneaky attack from Grinch Enterprises to cause more havoc? Analyze the file to see if you can determine whether it's malicious or not. Okay. Um... So I guess we're actually going to be on this attack, uh, be on this machine, I guess. We have to wait for it to boot. Um, all right, so this, yeah, this is just more, more stuff I was doing before. So the file command in Linux basically tries to tell you what type of file it is. Strings literally searches for strings. Um, that is uh, usually... Um, uh, strings of characters that are in the ASCII range, principal characters effectively, um, i.e. nothing that's um, control characters and stuff like that. Strings is awesome. Um, what else are we going to use? 
Okay, we're going to submit to virus total, which is also good. Uh, all right. Open the terminal and navigate to the file on the desktop named test file. Use the strings command. Check the strings in the file. There's only a single line of output to the strings command. Interesting. I can't find a Windows command that does what file does. Yeah, I'm not sure if there is one either. There might be a PowerShell thing that does it. All right, let's go into the terminal and let's actually fix the terminal. There we go. Uh, desktop. All right, strings on test file. Ah! Who in my chat knows what this is? Every pen tester should know what this is. Rich, yes, has got it. Um, but what does it do? What is the purpose of this string? Test it, yeah, pretty much. So this is a, um, I guess it's now a standard. I'm not entirely sure who came up with the standard, but it is a an ASCII string <coughs> that all antivirus uh, programs should detect as a virus, even though it's not. It is a test string. However, it is infinitely more clever than that. Because even though this is a string that can effectively be typed using a regular keyboard, it is also technically a viable binary program which executes, I believe, on Windows. Um, if you go to iCar Wiki. Not many people know that, by the way. Um, yeah, so it doesn't execute on 64-bit, but it is a um, MS-DOS program, which then just prints this string. And you can type it. It's in, That's insane. <laughs> it's super clever. Um, so it is actually executable on older versions of Windows. Uh, yeah. That's this is the honestly this is the more genius bit I think is that they actually made execute execute stuff, um, so it is technically an executable. But well, that's irrelevant. We're going to copy this icar string. Um, check the file type. I'm guessing it's going to say binary. Oh, no, actually, so file actually does recognize the iCar virus. That's kind of cool. Uh, fun fact about the iCar virus. Um, back when, when Bitcoin was in its earlier days, so for those who don't know what how Bitcoin works, effectively everyone has a ledger where the Bitcoin transactions are um, sent to and recorded. And when you mine a new block, you can add a comment. Um, and so, for instance, the Genesis block has the date of a, I think, a New York Times. Uh, no, not New York Times. I think it has uh, some London um, article where the, the headline was that um, something about the banking crisis. Uh However, you can you can submit pretty big comments and they get recorded on all ledgers across the blockchain. Uh, and so obviously at some point, somebody put the iCar virus <laughs> in a comment, um, which caused a bunch of blockchains to just get deleted. 
<laughs> of people, which is fine because you can just download it again. Um, but I think they had. I think um, they. They. I'm not sure how they fixed it. Uh, I, I. I figure the um, maybe antivirus got updated. Uh, but I know that's uh, that's a funny thing that happened once. Um, yeah, base. I mean, come on, it's gonna happen, right? If you if you have a way to distribute a, the same file amongst millions of different computers, someone's gonna put a virus in it somewhere. <laughs> All right, calculate the files hash. Um, so we can just do MD5 sum. Now MD5, obviously, you shouldn't use for anything to do with passwords anymore. Um, however, it's still pretty good when it comes to uh, just creating a, a hash for a file. It's very fast, which is obviously what you want. Um, we go to virus total. Uh, virus total. Those who don't know, if we search for it, it, you can upload files. It will scan them using multiple different antivirus software and report back whether it was detected or not. Um, it also now I think does a bunch of um, it'll execute it on like a, in a contained environment and see what it does. But you can also just search for a has a hash. Sorry. All right, and as you can see, it's a. Uh, Detected by almost everything, apart from a few down here, which is funny. Um, what was the question? Where was when was the file first seen in the wild? Um, details, maybe. Yeah, here we go. On the virus totals detection tab, oh hang on, we we got a battle to start, guys. We'll we'll, we'll go to the battle. Uh, stream raiders. Oh, I died. <laughs> hey, we're victorious anyway. That's good. <laughs> All right, we will grant rewards to Chad Binu. Yeah, there you go. All right, we'll choose another battle. And I'll remember to actually put down my guy now. Um, put him there. All right, back to here. <laughs> Uh, a virus tells detection tab. What is the classification assigned to the file by Microsoft? Right. Is virus so it has that you see this is um, this shows that it's actually Microsoft detected it as a DOS file. Uh, go to this link to learn more about the file. Yeah, icar.org. What were the first two names of this file? It used to be named ducklin.html or ducklinhtml.html. Okay. The file has 68 characters in the start, uh, known as the known string. It can be appended with white space characters up to a limited number of characters. What is the maximum number of total characters that can be in the file? I think it's 128. Okay, good. Uh, let's shut down that and move on. Day 26, needles in computer stacks. We're going to learn what Yara rules are basic structure of Yara rules, how to write basic Yara rules, and how Yara rules are used. And presumably what what the heck Yara is, because I have no idea. Here we go. 
Multi-platform tool for matching patterns of interest in malicious files. Ah, it's like a fancy version of grep. It is used to perform research on malware families and identify malware with similar patterns. Right. So a very fancy version of grip. <laughs> All right. Syntax of the R rule. It's got some metadata. I'm guessing it's got defined strings so you can search for specific strings. Or sorry, you can define specific strings. This is just defining variables, I guess. And then conditions, I guess you have to match text string and hex string. So if a file only contains the hex string, it won't match because it doesn't contain text. Okay. Um, defined as variables, yeah, I kind of guess that. Uh, d -d 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 conditions and operator or not perfect. <laughs> Pretty basic, okay. Metadata is optional. All right. Now, using the knowledge gained from this task, let's start writing a rule. We'll write a rule that matches some strings from the ICAR test files. Okay. Okay, so we go to the Skype type thirty. Um, okay, so I guess we copy this and paste it. Save this file. And give it a name of our choice. I mean, icar.yara. Probably a good name for it. <laughs> Running the Yara rules. So now we have written a rule that's on how to run it. The syntax to run a Yara rule can be simply stated as follows. Okay. So I'm gonna, I think I saved it on my desktop. Didn't I? Maybe not. Did I just save it in here? I did. All right. Yara, um, okay, so we do the iCar Yara file, and then we have to do the desktop test file. Um, when the rules are hit, the output will look like this. Okay. So basically, if it outputs, it matches. Use the M option for Yara to return the metadata when the rule is hit. Okay, dash M. Nice. We can use the S option to print the strings. Okay, so it matched all those strings. Um, screenshot contains three of the four strings we wrote in the rule. This is because we modified the rule before running the command. Okay. Uh, we changed the text in the string $A as shown in the ICAR we wrote from X50, X50 to X50. That is, we replaced the letter O with the number 0. The condition for the YAR rule is dollar sign $A, so A and B and C and D. If we are on, to only make a change in the first Boolean operation in this condition, what Boolean operator shall we replace the AND with? That's an OR, obviously. Um, what option is used in the Yara command in order to list down the metadata of the rules? That was dash M. What section contains information about the author? Um, the author? Is it just author equals? Is it metadata? Even though it's technically just says meta there okay uh what option is used to print only rules that did not hit okay so now we have to go mr streamer all right thank you rudio <laughs> please only please only use that one when uh i'm not paying attention to chat 
Uh, okay, so... Print only rules that did not hit. Um, oh, must be negate. That makes sense. Change the yar rule for the dollar sign a string to x50. Rerun the command. Okay. Uh, with the C option. What's the result? Zero. So what does C do? Count. Right, prints only number of matches. Okay, there we go. All right, we're done. Nice. Okay, let's uh, continue. That was a nice easy one. So far, the one that took the most time is the playing the containers one. All right. Um, oh, okay. We're going to use CyberChef. Nice. Who doesn't know what CyberChef is? I wonder if we can actually do it without the box, because CyberChef is host online. It's a really cool um, thing. The GCHQ, which is effectively the UK's NSA, created. Um, so yeah, we can use it to decode this string. You just you paste the input in here. Um, clearly, there's no recipe yet, um, so the output's the same. But you can say you can just drag from base64. Um, it's set up to auto bake. So basically, you can drag things to do uh, progressively to this string. So we just said dec like decode it from base sixty four. We get that. Um, if we then, for instance, want to uh, convert it to hex, we can do that. If we want to do the opposite, so convert it to hex, then base sixty four decode it. We get that. <laughs> so nonsense. Oh, cat time. Okay. All right. Uh, let me go fetch Raven. I'll be right back. All right, she's not very happy about this. Let me uh, let me switch to the webcam. Uh, where are we? There we go. All right, hang on. I have her slightly babied. She wasn't sleeping. She's not just not very happy about this. Oh, what are you doing? There's all the nice people. All right, you can go. Right, I'm gonna close my door. All right, there we go. All right, so what's her name? Raven. Cause she's black. Uh, okay, let me switch back to the live screen. Uh, right, so we did that. Why don't we just go down to the... Uh... Mm. 
All right, okay, we should probably read this. This looks important. Um, Olay dump, old dump. Is an excellent tool written in Python. Uh, helps you analyze all their files. You think of all their files as a mini file system. Is it Ole or Ole? O L E? O L E sounds better. Uh, similar to a zip archive. All right. You can run that command. Okay, so we'll open a command prompt. Olive. Are there actually documents in here? No. Um, okay. You missed. You missed the kitty. You guys. She was in here. Uh Okay. Hmm. Grinch Enterprise left a malicious document. <laughs> uh, Zutsu Kulipa. I already got the kitty. If you want another kitty, you have to specify which kitty. <laughs> you have three available. Um. Just memeing. Okay, good. Uh, all right. Well, I guess this is the challenge. The virtual machine will launch in browser if you wish to access. Okay, we don't need to do that. Um, what is the username from the decoded script? Okay, so I'm, I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be in Santa Claus. Yeah. Okay. So let's do OLED dump or OLE dump. Um, dot dot slash dot dot slash Santa and that okay all right what are we looking for here all right this is what we found Grinch Enterprise left a malicious document machine. You need to find it. The document contains a malicious, obfuscated base 64 encoded script that comes with a secret. You'll need to find the stream that contains the. Okay, right, so we can do number 8 F8 D. Okay, there we go. Grinch Enterprise is coming for you, and then this string, which we'll copy. Uh, okay, that didn't. Oh, it's right, so it's encoded. XOR 35, right? So we need to do an XOR. It's just going to be. You can just usually search. XOR is a little different to. Um... Hang on a minute. 35, don't forget to choose decimal. That's probably what I didn't do. Okay, so this is another. This looks like more base 64, maybe, so we can. From base 64 again. Yeah, there we go. All right, we did it. All right, so. What is the username from, sorry, email address from the coded script? This thing. What is the mailbox password you found? I'm guessing this. Subject of the email is this. What port is the script using to exfiltrate data? 
587 it looks like hey angel d uh what is the flag hidden found in the document that grint enterprises left behind use the following Uh, so it's either it looks like it's either gonna be six, seven, or nine, or maybe twelve. Hang on, let's uh. Uh, no. There it is. You found Grinch cookie. There's still a second flag somewhere. So do we do... I guess we just keep searching through these streams, maybe. Is it this? Bad McSkitty? Or sub bad McSkitty? Um, I imagine it's the number 12 one, which this is interesting. Um, I'm going to take the hint. Deobfuscated PowerShell script. Okay, so it's that was, I think it was maybe 13. Yeah, here we go. PowerShell uh, encoded command. That doesn't help me. Uh... Might be better. I'm just trying to see how many characters this is. So is it Grinch Enterprise was here? Don't think so. Stream eight, you say? No, because stream eight was. Wasn't stream eight the one from before? Yeah, stream eight's the one from before. Um. think mm -hmm. 
<laughs> there, well, there's a second. So it says there's a second flag. Can you find it on the machine? This was the first flag. In the pictures folder? Ah, oh, okay, maybe, yeah. Uh, let's go to local disk, users. There we go. Nicely done, guys. Uh, oops. Of course, I have to freaking type it. Uh, is real. Nice. All right. Uh, thank you very much. All right, two more. PowerShell Elif Magic. So this is gonna use Elif, maybe? <laughs> uh, okay, so what are we doing here? Um, one of the administrators with access to the Elf Dome defense system realized his pass profile was missing from his desktop. Without the pass, he's not able to log in. You need to expect the event logs to determine what has occurred and see if you can retrieve the password from the deleted text file. Okay. You can audit commands run in the PowerShell console on each workstation. This is known as PowerShell logging. Okay, so we need the event IDs for... 4103 and 4104. So we wait for this to boot. And then it looks like we just open the event viewer, which I have used before, so that's fine. Um, filter by the date. Okay. What command was executed as Elf Miskini? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, this should be good. So it's taking so long. How is everyone doing, by the way? Everyone excited for the holidays? Glad to hear it. We're almost done. All right. Okay. So when you search for event log. Oh, maybe not. Event viewer, there we go. Okay. Oh, wait, are we not? Oh, okay, there's this thing here. All right, we'll use this. 
Um, so we need to choose a data source, I'm guessing. Uh, okay, advanced options. All right. The events this of interest took, point, uh, took place a few weeks ago. So we can do... Um, a specific local time. 11.10. Uh, 1pm. Until eleven twelve at the same time. Uh, show only the specific event IDs four one zero three and four one zero four. Show only PowerShell. Uh, alternatively, you can search base. Uh, we'll just do this first. Zero items. Uh, what did we do? Oh, uh, all right, so they're not quotes. I thought they were quotes for some reason. They are asterisks. There we go. What was the command? What command was executed as Elf McNeely to add a new user to the machine? Let me move this so I can see how many we've got. Uh. So we got the user, so we can look for Elf McNeely. And we'll probably scroll down here. Maybe we can just search for, um, I guess user. All right, let's do um, stream readers quick. We won. All right. Killer 2224, well done. There we go. All right. All right, so we... I'm trying to find... What does the command execute as Elf McNeely to add a new user? You can further filter by description string, invoke. Okay. Uh, doesn't look like it. 
Oh, because I left an R. Oh, we've got a few here. Okay, got some interesting stuff there. I guess we could probably just search for PowerShell add user, right? And then we could just filter by that. New local user. Or potentially new AD user. Let's try local user first. Uh, sorry. New, uh, all one word, hyphen local user. None, okay, maybe it was a D user. No. Just user. I'm going to take the hint because this is research CV. Oh, okay. So it wasn't actually a. <laughs> All right. So it was an ex exploit, apparently. Um. Let's actually just put in the the CVE and see what happens. Um, one six seven five. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, So downloaded this. Um, so inv we're looking for invoke nightmare then. This is what the script contains. So we'll check Invoke Nightmare. Okay, that's the script block. Invoke Nightmare. Um, Yeah, invoke nightmare is the command from this. But at the same time, it's not actually. It doesn't look like they executed it. If they did, it's I can't see the actual command. Yeah, so they add the user down here, look. But they have to run it using add invoke nightmare. Uh, you, actually, okay, hang on. So it adds... Maybe it's just a default. So it uses... 
Uh, okay, hang on. I think I think this is it. So it uses admin with a one. Um, and so I think it uses TB FC dash AOC twenty three backslash admin with a one. No. Uh, I typed that wrong. Uh, I guess we could search new user. Oh, what command was executed? Oh, so it's just invoke nightmare. Oh, jeez. Okay. I'm just running. I th I, for some reason, I thought... For some reason, I thought it was asking for the username. I don't know why. Oh, cause probably because I read this one. What user executed the PowerShell file? PowerShell file to send the password.txt. Can't freaking read. Let's do PowerShell.txt. Oh, I spent way too long on that one. Um, I was deleting it. Okay. So this is maybe this. All right, so this is the admin. Well, at least I found that. Okay. What was the IP address of the remote server? Ah, uh, okay. So it's ten, ten, one, four, eight, nine, six, um, comma, four, three, two, one. What was the encryption key used to encrypt the contents of the text file? Uh, this. What was the application used to delete? Uh, it looks like it was sdelete.exe. There we go. What does the date and timestamp log show the password.txt was deleted? Okay, this is going to be over here, probably. Uh, so, 11, 11, 20, 21, 7, 29, 27. Okay, what were the contents of the deleted password file? Ah, okay. So, <laughs> so presumably, look if we look for the HTTP, is there a? Did it record the actual request? Because if it recorded the request. Yeah, there we go. So we can actually go back to here, I think. Uh, if we clear this. Um. And actually go back to password.txt. I think. Uh, convert from secure string. I need to Google secure string encryption algorithm. Mm. 
using the advanced encryption standard AES. Okay, so presumably AES decrypt. Copy. Um, not in hex, but UTF-8. Or maybe, no, it's, it can't be base 64. Uh, is this base 64? Hang on. I mean, this very much looks like base 64 apart from this crap at the start. <laughs> let's, let's search the HTTP request again, because I think there's possibly something else going on. Where was the... Output format. I just want to find out what the output format is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just assuming it's base 64. Um, it could be base 32. This bit. Mm -hmm. uh, from base 64. And uh, if we. Pause that one yet. Um. Is it base thirty two, maybe? No. Um. <laughs> It's, it's really weird that there's this well I guess not it's just obviously this looks like concatenation between this and something else Uh, I think what I'm going to do, I'm just going to delete. I'll uh, pause that. Sorry, hang on. Pause that. Do this. Uh, right, and then we'll just start deleting. So, I think that might be the way to do it, mm -hmm. is copy this, mm 
We yeah, we'll take the hint in a minute. Let's just let's just try this first. All right, we'll do. Invalid. Okay, invalid IV. Is this the IV? So that could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Ah, uh, okay, that might be the IV. Uh. <laughs> um. Oh, the in inputs are raw. Alright, I'm gonna take the hint. Oh. <laughs> we were doing we we're doing it way harder. Decrypted.ps1. Uh okay, let's search for this. I'm I'm still gonna try it with um whoops. Decryptor. Oh, there's decrypt there. What? Oh my god. Is there like a PowerShell? There's there's got to be a way of doing it though. All right. I'm this. No, I'm gonna refuse this. Skill string PowerShell. Uh, decrypt algorithm. Convert to secure string. I'm just going to read up on this. Convert to because this, if this is using AES, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do it in CyberChef. Anyway. So a secure string object we need to look up. So is it, it's potentially because it's a, okay. So it might it might just be it's a it's an object in PowerShell. So it's not actually the data. I'm just going to do decrypt secure string manually. Here we go, stack overflow. Maybe this will do it. No, that's obviously using that. Um, All right.
Enter encrypted text. We'll surrender. Um, I'm, I'm definitely interested if there is a way to do it without having to do this, because this still does look like it's just some kind of data string. But I don't want to keep everyone. Uh, that was the wrong thing. Because I didn't... Oh, I can't copy. Okay, hang on. Um, what do we need to do? Uh, okay, I could just I could just search for J3PN. I'm just interested in knowing. And if anyone maybe can Google while we while we do the next one, the format of a PowerShell secure string in terms of what does all this mean? Is this is this bit an encoded IV? Um, is it ju this just base sixty four? Is it something else? Uh, we'll save that. Uh, how do you run it from here? There we go. Um, I'm super interested in knowing now because I think it would be useful if you if you didn't have access to a PowerShell environment but you could you had a secure string maybe um, and in fact I'm gonna copy this uh, we don't need that anymore and I'm gonna copy the and this is the secure string mm -hmm. and we'll save that on the desktop as to do reverse engineer secure string <laughs> there we go Yeah, I know just a guy. Yeah, obviously you can just boot up a VM, right? But at the same time, I, 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 okay, so I, sh I should explain. I have a, um, a mild fascination with encryption. So I am extremely interested in what actually a secure string in PowerShell is made of because it, it's based on, we know it's based on AES. And if it's based on AES and not using some weird, proprietary algorithm afterwards assuming that is the case there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to decode this decrypt I mean um, what's this link uh, copy that all right so oh, okay so it's the CS um, Defines the implementation of convert from secure string. Okay, so that's good because that's the reverse, right? Um. Yeah, MT. Um, but it is encrypted. So. It's definitely an AES encrypted string, but it's formatted somewhere. So. my I, I'm just questioning how we. Okay, yeah, there is ba okay, so there is base sixty four. Okay, so here we go. Um, encrypted content equals string. Okay, here we go. It's got an IV. 
trim out the header and retrieve the rest of the string. So there's a, there's a secure string export header, which is presumably this, this crap. Um, and then the rest is the remaining but data is base 64 encoded. Um, you can convert bytes. Yeah. And then you, okay. So it's, it's, uh, it's split. Okay. So it's Unicode. And then the, yeah, there's some kind of split. We need to figure out what this, this pipe thing is, but effectively it's this data is this thing is split into three different things. Um, cause data elements dot length. The second, sorry, the last is the encrypted content. And the second is the IV, which is also base 64 encoded. Uh, so you're saying that when we use PowerShell to encrypt something, it's just for me. No, no, it is encrypting it. Um, if you go back to here. Um, there's advanced encryption standard. Uh, it said it here somewhere. It's encrypted using AES. I found it somewhere. Anyway, it's it's definitely encrypted using AES. But the point is, after it's encrypted, um, it's formatted in in a, in a proprietary way, which we're reading about here. All right, so this is the encrypted content, but it also has an IV, which is also Base64 encoded. So it's it's twice Base64 encoded, really. Um, and then. I want to see where the encrypted content goes. The secure string helper has the decrypt. After encryption is base 64 hashing, not it's not hashing in encoding. Um, I want to see where this helper class is. Uh, is it in here? Let me Google for it. There we go. So if we look down to encrypt in here, um, uh, match case. Okay, yeah, here we go. Return encrypt. So there's definitely an encrypt. AES, there we go. Yeah, it uses AES. Right there. So. Hashing, encoding, encryption, whatever. There's a there's a difference. You should know these things. You, it's, a, it's a common question to get on if you go into like a pen test um, interview. Knowing what the difference is. All right. Um... <laughs> All right, let's do stream raiders. That's the, the last, the last stream raiders um, before we do this box, uh, and then I will do the box, and then we will end the stream, and everything will be good. All right, here we go. Oh, I died. This might be the end. I don't know. We, we are killing. Chad B has like 25 kills. That's insane. Nice. We did it, guys. All right. Um, 
Let's grant the rewards. Chabby Noob gets them. Perfect. All right. I'm not going to set up another one because we'll um, we'll probably be ending the stream after this. Okay. No video. That's fine. Uh, okay. We're learning about... Oh, it's Mimic Cats. Nice. Okay. Open the PowerShell. And navigate to the desktop. Uh, sorry, Mimicats. 60, X64. Uh, dot slash Mimicats. That's not what I wanted to do. Dot slash Mimicats. Dot exe. Okay. Uh, privilege debug to check we have permissions, which we should because we're the admin. We do. And we can use SecurSA logon passwords. I'm just going to dump a load of logon passwords. Um, all right, let's scroll the way up again. So we've got Emily. We've got Emily's NTLM and SHA1 hash. Uh, so we want the NTLM hash. Go back to the attack box. I should probably make sure I have extend the machine. Um, all right, we're going to hash.txt and paste it. That's not going to work. We need to actually use the copy. There we go. Okay, John, format equals NT, word list equals user, share word list, Rocky, oops, Rocky, hash, and I guess it wants to give the uh, pot, output.txt. All right, we'll see if we can crack this. We can, it's, uh, that's an easy one. Um, we can answer this question. Was the MTL on hash this user? Oops, cache hash dot txt. Uh, it's this. I guess we've done it. Um, that was easy. Boom. All right, we're done. Um, awesome. Whew. Okay, yeah, so maybe at one point I'll work on this. I'll see if I can <laughs> I'll see if I can reset. Well, I'll, I'll Google and see if anyone else has reverse engineered um, secure strings in PowerShell because maybe they have. Um, if not, I will. Um, I will try and do it. It's going to be interesting. Tell us on Twitter your findings. Yes, I will. Speaking of, let's uh, pop up this. So my socials are on the bottom. Please follow me on Twitter. Join our Discord server. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you are currently watching me on Twitch. So please consider giving me a follow. 